Okay, right, first of all, the smoke alarm. I can't do anything because I've got to get a ladder that fits on the stairs so that I can get to the smoke alarm, and I, apart from battering it with a stick until it shuts up. There's nothing I can do. So you're just going to have to cope. I'm really sorry. I know how spectacularly badly produced these videos are. I'm very, very sorry. But what I'm going to do right now is we're going to go back to talking about the family and we're going to talk about the some of the functions that work in that are contained within the family unit which are now a matter of, you know, policymakers' concern, which this was not the case at the beginning of last century. This is the, the, the case at the beginning of la this century. These things have changed. So there's a sociologist called um, Bengston who I really like. And he didn't really have much family, and so he was very, very interested in the implications of changing family structures. And family is one of those things that's really difficult to um, examine because it's to do with identity. Now, identity is like, um, you know the base code on your... You know the file on your computer where you can't rename anything and you can't drop anything and you can't delete anything because if you do, you'll absolutely balk up your entire operating system and you won't know why. Identity is like that. Identity is the stuff that we have about how we see ourselves and what we're connected to and it's the kind of base code that allows us to reproduce systems effortlessly throughout our lives. And much of this base code comes from never think about identity without thinking about attachment. So at the, at the centre of like the systems that we have around children, we understand that the development of identity and attachment happen within kind of childhood and we understand how they occur roughly and we understand that they're linked and they're very much about relationships with primary caregivers, with family. And it's this that gives us the base code that allows us to reproduce systems effortlessly. And one of the reasons that looked after children have such a raw deal is because the base, the base code for the systems that we will reproduce eff effortlessly <laughs> is really bad. And we have to reflect constantly on that identity in a way that other people don't, so that we don't accidentally reproduce things that are really not good. The other thing is that we have institutions in our identity, and we've had to accommodate the fact that institutions can't re re replicate these kinship relations. And so we've had to accommodate the next best thing, which is where decisions are made by me, which means that we have a very, you know, we're quite shaped by institutions. And it's this um, code that allows us to kind of reproduce systems effortlessly throughout our lives and these relationships that we actually don't acknowledge. Now, Thomas Piketty noticed that, per that wealth was resisting redistribution through family. Well, we already know that. That's the foundation of class. This is also the major stabilising institution. Now, when I say that the change to family structure that my mother's generation represented was one of the most significant alterations in history, I'm not joking. These functions within the family unit have existed and been how the human race has reproduced society and the economy effortlessly, without thought, forever. Since, you know, forever. <laughs> really, you can go and look at Scara Brain, you can look at those houses and you can look at the layout of those houses and you ask yourself when that was. This is how we have always done it. The emancipation of women from abuse and kind of the change to this family structure so that the power dynamics changed was major. But we've actually coped with it remarkably well, and we've barely noticed it. So this has happened around us, and we've accepted it. Now, one of the problems is that now we have to start thinking about the functions within that unit, and it's this that our current economics won't let us do. So one of the things that we have to start thinking about is intergenerational reciprocity. So that's the way that generations kind of communicate and support each other, and, and the time and money transfers that go between generations, because that's really crucial to understanding how our economy functions. It's crucial to understanding how inequality reproduces, but it's also crucial to understanding how we remain stable. So Bengston, this sociologist who didn't really have any family and so was really good with the family, he argued that multi-generational bonds were becoming more important because... Um, oh, he basically said that multi-generational bonds are more important than nuclear family ties for well-being and support over the life course. And he was talking about changing US demographics, including an aging population and falling fertility rates. Now, he was describing the 1900, but he used, um, a, he described it in terms of shapes, which I find really useful, so I'm going to do that to you. So he described the 1900 American population as represented by a pyramid with a large base represented by many, many children under five, and then it kind of tapers into a narrow group of those aged 65 or over who will need care. 
And actually, within the family structures that he was discussing, there were sufficient resources to more or less take care of childcare and elder care within this unit. But he argues that actually changing lifespans, birth rates, fertility rates, um, changing family structures, the changing role of women means that now we have to actually look at intergenerational reciprocity. And he argues that this pyramid shape has kind of gone. And by 2013, it will look more like um, a rectangle with kind of equal or less numbers, more kind of old people at the top requiring care and less babies at the bottom kind of providing future provision for that care, and that actually it's the functions between these generations that's going to be important, and there's a huge, a huge amount of literature, and sociology has actually got a huge amount of really, really important family literature, but what sociology is missing is a link to the institutions where new family forms are actually decided, so I did a families and inequalities course at the LSE, which is a sociology course. And in my first essay, I was discussing the family court system as a place where new family forms are decided on a daily basis. No connection. They, she was going... <coughs> like she didn't... They had never, she had never looked at it. She didn't even consider this. And so there is a disconnect in sociology, which is the discipline where they should be able to start offering advice, where they don't know <coughs> how this is shaping current systems. So I wanted to talk about that intergenerational reciprocity and why it presents such a difficulty. And what intergenerational reciprocity is, is the time and money transfers between generations. And these things cannot be understood in terms of money alone, because if you just look at the direction of money, it's not telling you enough. And this is what the care economy is. This family structure is at the centre of these institutions that government now has responsibility for. We can't abdicate that responsibility. We will still have to regulate the care economy. We can't abdicate that responsibility. We will still have to provide within the care economy. We can't abdicate that. So now what we have to understand is how these systems have been shaped by this change to family structure, and they have been quite reliably, but what we also have to understand is that these systems are part of the multi-generational flow of time and money. And what that actually means is that you know, the care labour that you do for your children when, you know, you're not doing it as cynically, you're not you're going, I'm looking after my retirement by caring for my child, but it's the relationships that you establish here, it's establishing intergenerational reciprocity within childhood that then takes care of the rest of your needs through your life and contributes to that. Now, in the care economy, the majority of um, people who take responsibility for that labour and have to manage that kind of transition between kind of the market sphere and then these institutions that join other spheres and then this labour that's in the private sphere, that's still women. Which is why our, gen our welfare states are gendered. Um, but what we've kind of been historically doing at LSE level is going, oh, that's just women, that's fine. But actually this is a fundamental alteration to the structure of the way that we have to start seeing the economy. So with instance, we've had asset-based welfare where we've been treating because we haven't been considering this time and money transfer, because we haven't been considering how it is that the human race actually reproduces, how our society actually reproduces, which functions within this family unit we have retained, even as heterogeneity of family forms has become accepted. We're kind of at a loss of these systems, and that's what this crisis is kind of correcting. So the care economy, multi-generational bonds, are more important than they've ever been. And we have kind of had this asset-based welfare model where we've got, oh yeah, debt and a house will sort it. No, it's these bonds. And in the meantime, what we've been doing is lashing out at kind of the women doing this labour, this essential stuff that's actually accommodated the change in structure of the family and the changing structure of the kind of... We've basically been attacking them as being wasteful <laughs> because economists can't see this stuff. So that's all I really want to say. I don't know if that made sense. I'm going to watch it back again.